Organic chemistry and science in general is full of words that have been invented by squishing other words together. If I squish the words alkene and alcohol together, for example, then I make a new word, enol. If I combine the words hybrid and carcinoma, then I make a new word, hybridoma. And to use my dorky joke from before, if I squish the words payless and worthers together, then I get the new word, worthless. The humorous nature of scientific terms brings me back to a time when I was taking Biology 1210 as a student at Utah State University. While taking that class, I learned about a transport enzyme called adenylyl cyclase. Yes, I said that correctly, adenylyl cyclase. There are two YLs at the end of the word in sequence, one after the other. I'll never forget that name, because having two YLs back to back at the end of a word to me just sounds absolutely hilarious. While I was studying this term with my friends, I used to make extra fun of the word by calling it a cyclase. Now I realize that tangent has nothing to do with this slide, but I just like tangents sometimes, so I thought I'd throw it at you. The aldol reaction, which we covered at the end of our last lecture, is another one of these combined terms. To review it, I want to remind you that if we take an aldehyde or a ketone, as shown here, and treat it with a base, the base will strip the alpha hydrogen, giving me this enolate. That enolate then stirs around in solution and sees another molecule of starting material, aldehyde or ketone. The negatively charged carbon will close in on that carbonyl carbon, thrusting the electrons up to give this intermediate. This intermediate then lingers until it gets protonated by water to give this product, which we can redraw as this. This product, you'll notice, is an aldehyde at the end with an alcohol on the beta carbon. Thus, we can say that it's a beta hydroxy aldehyde. In other words, the aldol reaction takes an aldehyde starting material and makes a product that has an aldehyde in it and an alcohol in it. So if I take the two terms aldehyde and alcohol and squish them together, I make the word aldol. The Claisen condensation is very similar to the aldol reaction, except that it involves two esters instead of two aldehydes or ketones. The product also looks very similar to an aldol product, except that it has a beta ketone instead of a beta alcohol. Here's the mechanism. We begin with an ester, once again, instead of an aldehyde or a ketone, as we would in the aldol reaction we treat it with a base. Now I have to point out something here. This base has to look exactly like the ester component, so except that it has a negative charge on the oxygen. So this would be the sodium or potassium alkoxide equivalent of this ester portion of the molecule. That's relevant because if I had an alkyl chain dangling off of this oxygen in my base that was different from the alkyl chain in the ester. Then the base would just come into this carbonyl. Electrons would go up, electrons would go down and kick off the ester group to do a transesterification. Because I'm starting with an ester ba uh, because I'm starting with a base that is a complementary base to the ester group dangling off here then even if it does do uh, or add into the carbonyl, the product of that competitive reaction is identical to the starting material. With that said, now we get back to the mechanism. My alkoxide base, once again complementary to the ester starting material, comes in, strips an alpha proton to give me this enolate. That enolite stirring in solution then looks around and sees another molecule of starting material. The negatively charged carbon adds into the carbonyl, thrusting the electrons onto the oxygen to give this intermediate. Now this might look really weird to you, but what it is is it's the product of two of these materials getting together, joined at this carbon, thrusting into this carbonyl carbon. Now this is very similar to 
the corresponding intermediate in the aldol reaction, except for this one major difference. In an aldol reaction, I've begun with an aldehyde or ketone. So instead of having an OR group here, I've got an H or an alkyl group. Now, an H or an alkyl group are not good leaving groups. By comparison, an OR group is. So at this stage, what occurs is the negative charge on the oxygen comes down and kicks off that leaving group. Now that does not happen with an aldol reaction. The O minus lingers until it gets protonated to form an OH. But because I have this leaving group for my ester starting material, the O minus comes down kicks off the leaving group to form this double bond. This is my final Claisen condensation product. Now I'm going to redraw this pretty, but to help facilitate this visually, I've numbered our carbons beginning at the ester carbonyl carbon here. So carbon 1, 2, 3, and 4 gives me my main chain. If I redraw that looking a little bit prettier all in a straight line, you'll see I've got carbon 1, that's my ester carbonyl carbon, Carbon 2 has this R chain dangling off of it. Carbon 3 has the carbonyl carbon here, that's the ketone. And carbon 4 is a CH2 bound to an R group. You can see that the product of a Claisen condensation, in contrast with that of an aldol reaction, is a beta keto ester. So I begin with an ester, treat it with a complementary alkoxide base, get that ester to condense on a second molecule of starting material, ultimately arriving at a beta keto ester, that is, a carbon-oxygen double bonded here. You'll remember that the product of the aldol reaction is a beta hydroxy, a single bonded OH to this beta carbon. The Robinson annulation is a sweet application of this kind of chemistry. Let's look at our starting materials and compare them with the product. We start with a ketone and react it with another ketone that's alpha beta unsaturated, and we ultimately end up with a fused cyclohexenone. This is a, an alkene, a ketone, fused to this ring like this. You might look at this and say, say what? Oh yeah, we start with a ketone, react it with an alpha beta unsaturated ketone, and end up with a fused cyclohexenone ring. So how do we do that? Well, here's the mechanism. Beginning from my cyclohexanone, I strip that with my base to generate this enol. This enol then does a Michael addition into my alpha beta unsaturated ketone. In other words, it's doing a 1,4 or conjugate addition into the double bond carbon. Electrons flip here, electrons flip up to give me my negatively charged uh, oxygen here. Negatively charged oxygen closes down like a trapdoor to give a double bond. And these electrons reach out to grab a proton from solvent to give this intermediate. At this stage, another molecule of base is going to strip a proton. But this time, it's stripping it from this terminal methyl carbon. So this terminal methyl carbon then gets a negative charge. And this enolate condenses back onto the carbonyl carbon present for my cyclohexanone. Electrons go up, give me a minus charge on this oxygen, which strips a proton from solvent to give me this beta hydroxy ketone intermediate. An E2 elimination of water, that is stripping a hydrogen here, dumping the electrons down and kicking off water as a leaving group, then gives me my final product. Now that might look like an amazing, crazy mechanism, but if you're puzzled by it, I invite you to pause this and look at it for long enough until it looks pretty straightforward. I gotta tell you, I think this reaction is absolutely amazing. In fact, if it doesn't make you cry with wonder and amazement, then you must be a soulless monster. Well, okay, it's not quite that amazing, but it is a whole heck of a lot cooler than throwing up a stomach full of Cheerios, which I have done. To this day, I still can't eat Cheerios without retching a little bit in my heart.